right near Seattle, Redmond. Okay, uh, my name is Chris Teich. I'm principal of St. Thomas the Apostle School, and I'm here with um, seventh grade and their teacher, Mr. Rante, and our tech coordinator. Uh, but some of us went to TEDx Team uh, in April in New York, and um, I was able to take six students. Uh, but we saw you there. Really? Oh, oh! Did they show the TED video? Yeah, they showed you, well, TEDx team was um, in New York City, and they had some presenters live, and they had some via video conferencing, uh, well, rather, via uh, a via, uh, film that you had done at the big adult tent, right? Yes. Okay, and where was that, in Scotland? Uh, the big, well, the big TED, they, they do have one in Scotland, that's TED Global, but the one I spoke at was actually their uh, main one in Long Beach, uh, so in California. And when was it that you gave that presentation? It was in February of uh, 2010. February 2010. I have to tell you, I go on TEDx team and TED all the time to listen to wonderful presentations. But yours certainly is one of the most impressive. And I was just saying to the children, I think you're like 10 or 11, but you're 13, so you're almost my age. In any event, um, <laughs> she's laughing. If she can see me, she must know that we're very far apart. Maybe. No, no, I'm no. Gonna no. <laughs> Anyway, it was a wonderful presentation. And before we end, my tech coordinator, Ms. Jung, and I want to pick your brain about how we can get invited to uh, the big tech, the global one in Scotland, which is like next week or next month, right? Yes. Oh, how to get invited. <laughs> Honestly, I'm trying to get invited. Well, actually, the thing is um, a bit more about the price. But um, I think, well, they actually, um, what I recommend is, uh, what I tried doing was writing the nonprofit at TED.com because they have a certain number of nonprofit memberships for people from education, and so that might be a good way. Uh, I, I believe it's nonprofit at TED.com, um, and inquire about because you're from education, and they're also trying this TED Ed project, so they're trying to uh, really, you know, improve education and. Uh, and be a part of the change. And so, if you inquire also about that project and maybe attending, uh, kind of like yeah, because otherwise it's very costly for poor people like me. Yeah, <laughs> and we also <laughs> we also try. That's why right, I, I will stop. I will stop uh, engaging in this conversation and let the children and their teacher take over. And you. Thank okay. You well, like thank you so morning. much. And actually, um, you know what's funny is I and I encourage all of you um, to watch the live stream. This will be on September 10th. Not sure if your school's back in session then, but uh, on September 10th, I'm organizing a TEDx event called TEDx Redmond. Uh, so it's all young people speaking, all young people organizing. So it's an amazing event. Last year, uh, I, I told the earlier class we had the youngest person to climb Mount Everest come and speak. So that was a pretty amazing experience. But right now we are going to talk about September 10th, September 10th, September 10th, yes. I can send you all the okay. information for sure. Um, and, okay. and about the live stream. So yeah, today, <laughs> to, get back, <laughs> to get back on that, um, I would love to talk about speech writing, but uh, Poetry Made Easy is uh, an amazing kind of topic because poetry <coughs> is really one of the most versatile writing types of writing that you can do, and you can really bring it anywhere. It could be short, it could be long, rhyming, non-rhyming. So how many of you have read some poems from Dancing Fingers? Raise your hand if you've read a poem from Dancing Fingers, one or two. See some raised hands? Great. So does anyone want to tell me uh, which one you read or which one was your favorite? The Fourth of July. The Fourth of July. Oh, the fireworks. And the, yeah, I like that one because it's very, it's very cheerful. It really evokes all that. Uh, all the food and the fireworks and the fun and so I wrote that poem actually around the 4th of July with that in mind. I love writing poems around holidays. 4th of July I have one about Halloween not in here but I've written one and so that's always a great topic. A big inspiration. Holidays can be wonderful inspirations. What else? The masquerade. The sorry? The masquerade. Masquerade. Oh yeah that one is Kind of an interesting one. Uh, I remember when I was writing that, I had a lot of different feelings, and so I was trying to, you know, channel my energy uh, and also create something. I think that I worked pretty hard on some of the rhymes as well. What are uh, any of any other of your favorite poems? Brandon. I'm sorry. Brandon. Brandon. Oh, that's right. Actually, you know, the funny thing about Brandon is that the inspiration came from, I have an older cousin, much older actually, she's in college right now, and so she was uh, 
toting around her juicy couture bag and her jeweled hoodie or whatever, okay, not a jeweled hoodie, but whatever kind of fancy brand names and was caring a lot about that, so I was sort of making fun of her in a way. Not that I ever told her that, but that's the awesome thing about poetry is that you can pick up these inspirations really from anywhere. You could write a poem making fun of your cousin, or you could write a poem making fun of your sister, and or you could write a poem that's very serious, that's a social commentary on something that you feel is wrong with the government or with our, I don't know, society or something like that. And so you can have, really poetry runs the game as far as serious, funny, long, short, rhyming, non-rhyming, there's just so much that you can do with it. But before I launch into an ode to poetry, I should probably quickly tell you who I am. My name is Adora Spitak, and my first book is called Flying Fingers, and it's a book of short stories. And then I started writing poetry because my mom essentially bribed me. She said, I'll buy you all the poetry books that you want if you start trying to write them. And so I ended up publishing the book Dancing Fingers with all of my poems in it. And now I've started writing more poems, and they've been hopefully getting better and better, and that's the great thing about poetry is that, you know, as you keep on going, you improve and you practice. First, I want to talk a little about the definition of poetry. So when you look at writing on a page, what makes that poetry? Well, according to the dictionary, literature in verse is poetry, literary works written in verse, in particular verse writing of high quality, great beauty, emotional sincerity or intensity, or profound insight. Now, the thing with this dictionary definition is that poetry is really hard to define because if I hand you a sheet of paper and I say, here, look at these words. Is this poetry? What is your criteria? What, what is your list for that you have to check off to make sure it's poetry? What do you think, guys? You must have some ideas. What are some of the things that make it poetry or not? What's the first one that you always thought of when you were little? Yeah, see, a lot of people have the idea of poetry rhymes, and some poetry does rhyme, and quite a lot of famous poems do rhyme, but quite a lot of famous poems and quite a lot of good poems also don't rhyme. So in Dancing Fingers, if any of you got the chance to page through and you went to my older sister's section, which is here at the back, and she's uh, share, shared some of her poetry, you'll notice none of it rhymes. There might be a um, rhyme here or there, but it's generally not rhyming. So poetry doesn't have to rhyme. Poetry doesn't have to be long. Poetry doesn't have to be separated into little uh, stanzas. So what then makes something a poem? That it has a rhythm to it. That it kind of has a rhythm to it. That's a very good point. A lot of poem is very musical. It might have a rhythm. It might sound very good spoken. It might even be written to be spoken. There's spoken word poetry. But not necessarily all poems sound that great when read out loud. In fact, you will come across a lot of very famous poetry that is beautiful to read and you can hear it in your mind, but when you read it out loud, it sounds terrible, or maybe not terrible, but not that great. There's awkward words here and there. So it, most of what we write has a certain rhythm to it. Whether it's a very smooth one is another question. So I want to quickly read you something, and uh, this is a little thing that we wrote, that I wrote with the last class that I did poetry with. And I want you to tell me whether you think it is a poem or not. Mustard stains on the cushions. I ate a donut and fell asleep on the couch. My parents told me not to slouch on the couch. I slouched and spilled my soda. One more stain, bluish green. That's a mean stain. Enter the dog, Stan Carl. Bright red tongue darts out. He hops on the couch, muddy paws leaving brown tracks. At first it was a white couch, then a stained one. Now it has been stained into a rainbow. <coughs> so, do you think this is a poem or is it not a poem? I love it. It's a poem. I hear some it's a poem. Okay, okay. so. And this is what we said, because when we set out to write this, we were like, let's write a poem about a couch. And it turned into this really wacky, crazy thing about all this hugely stained couch. So, uh, what do you think makes it a poem? Well, think, my loves, what does it make it a poem? If world famous authority of the West Coast to attack you, come on. Oh, it expresses 
has his feelings. Okay, so that's a good one. Well, the great thing about poetry is that it's very hard to put into a box. So you can't say poetry is to rhyme because it does. You can't say poetry is to be this or that. So really, poetry is whatever you make of it. And today we're going to be looking at all these inspirations for poetry and how we can write poems that are interesting to our readers but also to ourselves. And in order to do that, you don't necessarily have to say, I'm going to rhyme in the A, B, A, B rhyme scheme. I'm going to write this type of poem and it has this many lines. You don't necessarily have to do that. That can be part of it, but many great poems are written just completely someone sitting down and saying, I'm going to write about a couch. So that was the poem that, we wrote, that I wrote together with uh, last class. And so, why write poetry, you might ask yourself. It seems like something that people from a long time ago who are now dead just did, and I'm not super interested in poetry. Well, poems are easy to bring around. You can really sit down and write a poem anywhere. If you feel suddenly inspired, uh, as I was, then I wrote, once I wrote a poem that was two lines and it went like this. It's the only poem of mine that I've ever memorized. Hum dee dee dum goes the drum. Some sing along and hum. So there's a poem. It rhymes, but it's also just two lines. Who's to say that it's not a poem? So, ideas. Raise your hand if you've ever been stuck trying to think of an idea. I see some oh, raised hands. Did hand. you put the Yes, I have. I didn't see the we have. We all have. I think this is a pretty universal experience. Maybe it was trying to explain to your parents why something was missing out of the fridge. Or maybe it was trying to come up with an idea for a really deep poem or a story. Well, when it comes to thinking of ideas for poetry, where do you guys think we could get some inspiration? Yeah. Around the house. Around the house? Great, yeah, around the house is an excellent Thing. If you just uh, look randomly around, so for instance, I might just grab something. Uh, let me see here. I might just appear on the screen for a second. Okay, so I've grabbed something, and I have no idea. I think it's like a horn, or it makes noise when you blow into it. I'm not totally sure. Yeah, I think it's kind of a very simple instrument of some kind. I'm tempted to try, but I don't know how long this has been there. So probably wear it on your neck. So I might look at this and think, okay, so how could I write a poem about this? Well, I could look at the pattern in the material it's made out of and try to think, you know, what is this made out of? I could kind of zoom in and describe it as like a very image-based poem describing the horn. Or I could go even further. I could just think of what, where a horn's used, and I could think of a big medieval battle where somebody blew a horn and then all the people charged forward or something. Sort of cheesy like that. So. Looking at a totally random object like this, I could think of all these ideas for where it came from and what it does and what it looks like and what it could be used for and when it could be used uh, that would give me an idea for a poem. So, around the house is an excellent place. You can really get ideas for poetry from everything that you see around you. So, random objects. You guys probably have a lot of things, whether it's the ear of the person next to you, or books on the shelves, or what's outside the window, or the clock on the wall. These are all things that you could turn into poems. Trees, houses, coats, sidewalks, plastic containers, snowflakes on the ground. If you're wondering how we came up, for the last video comments, we wrote a poem about a couch, and what happened was I asked someone, what are random objects you could write a poem about and someone's had a couch and I was like, okay, sure, let's do that. So random objects can play a big role in coming up with poetry. And you might think, well, nobody's ever written a famous poem just about an object. Actually, they have. Very famous poem, it's called The Red Wheelbarrow by William Carlos Williams. And does anyone guess what The Red Wheelbarrow is about? It's about oh. a red wheelbarrow. Yeah, I know. What a huge surprise. So if you look at the poem, it seems pretty simple. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. So that's the red wheelbarrow by William Carlos Williams. Now, what do you think is the meaning of this poem? It's so simple, it's hard to say, I know. What do you think, guys? It's the wheelbarrow, yeah. The meaning is essentially what it says. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow. 
or it's about the red wheelbarrow and it's glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. It's so it's so simple and it's so short you could say it almost like a sentence. I basically just said the entire poem. So if you look at poetry, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to sit down and say, I'm going to write something super deep. It's going to be a social commentary on the injustices of uh, denying children the right to eat candy. You don't, I doubt that there are that many poets who say, I'm going to sit down and write about this like that. Instead, people sit, sit down and think, ah, it's so unfair, my parents won't let me eat that Snickers bar, I'm going to write about it. And so it's like, and then you start writing, and later when people analyze it, maybe they say, okay, this person was writing about social injustice and it takes on a meaning. But if you start writing thinking, I have to write about a meaning, I have to be super deep, then you might end up getting something that doesn't really show your real emotions. So start writing about something that uh, something that happens to you, something that makes you feel a certain way, and the meaning will really show itself. And if it has a very matter-of-fact, simple meaning, it'll come through, like in the Red Wheelbarrow. Poetry tip number one is that we can exaggerate ideas from everyday life. So let's say that you don't want to write about a red wheelbarrow, or sorry, that you want to write about a red wheelbarrow, but you want to make it more exciting. You want to make it really jump out at the reader. Or you want to write about something everyday or ordinary, but again, you want it to be special somehow. So the one way to do that is you can exaggerate. Does anyone know what exaggerate means? Oh gosh, you've been exaggerating. You're always exaggerating everything that happens here. To emphasize something? To, I'm sorry? To emphasize something? To emphasize something. Partially, well, let's say I, uh, I'm going down the stairs and I slip and fall and, it, and I'm okay. shouting and I say, I'm going to die! I slipped and I broke 20,000 bones! <laughs> then what am I doing? Exaggerated. So, whereas in a poem, you don't necessarily need to say, I broke 20,000 bones and be all that exaggerated. You can exaggerate things to make them really jump out at the reader and be more entertaining. So, for instance, I wrote this poem called The Sneeze. I'm not going to read it out because it's a pretty epic poem. But The Sneeze was this whole big page full of this person sneezing and how it kills people and <laughs> gets water all over, like all over an entire room and can be heard from outer space. So it's obviously extremely exaggerated. Uh, and the great thing about exaggeration is that it really catches people's attention and it can make a poem funny or really ridiculous to the point that you find people laughing. We can get inspirations for poetry from animals. Raise your hand if you have a pet. Lucky, I see some raised hands. Okay, so raise your hand if there is something funny that your pet does that you could write about in a poem. Very nice. Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry, you can, um, could you please call on the students? Sorry. Yeah. Like, I have a fish, so I like piece of bowl and it swims in the bowl because of the bed. Okay, so you have a fish, and it swims, I think you noticed that. Like, I kissed the bowl, and it will kiss me back. You oh. kissed the fish bowl? Okay, so you have the fish bowl, and you kiss it, and the fish kisses you back. That's very sweet. What an affectionate fish. I've never heard those two words together, but it sounds fine. Okay, what else? Any other funny tricks or things that your pets do? Um, my dog will, uh... She, um, after, like, if you leave her in a cage after a while and you let her out, she'll jump on you and she'll start squealing like a pig on purpose. Okay, she'll jump on you and start squealing like a pig. So, these <laughs> things might seem normal or everyday to you guys, but they do sound pretty weird to the rest of us. So, you can film them and submit a video to America's Funniest Videos, and while you're in the process, <laughs> you can also write a poem, and I think a poem will be very effective. Um, as far as, for instance, for the dog squealing like a pig, you could write a poem that exaggerates how loud it is. You could say, my neighbors complain incessantly about uh, and send in noise complaints because my dog, and then go on and say whatever your dog does, squealing like a pig, or barking, or running around day and night. And so taking inspirations or poetry from animals, even if they don't do funny things, just talking about the 
quiet beauty of a lizard, for instance. That would be an interesting poem. Inspirations are poetry from animals. The great thing is that they won't run out anytime soon. There's so many of them. So I wrote this poem called Cow. Some of you might have read it. And it's in the feathers, horns, and claws section of Dancing Figures. I have a most annoying cow who lazes in the sun. She torments every hen and sow and has a lot of fun. She gives no milk at all and moves away at night. Even when she's in her stall, she always picks a fight. Eventually, she ran away. Freedom had great allure. Away, away from her stall and hay. But she left a great deal of manure. <laughs> so, if you think about the image that I'm evoking there, not exactly beautiful. It's not a field of flowers or spring or dew on a leaf. But that's the lovely thing about poetry. So a lot of people think poetry is really dainty and it's sort of the thing that you read it while you're having a tea with your English grandmother or something. But uh, poetry doesn't have to be like that. You can write poems about dogs pooping on your couch or whatever gross thing strikes your fancy. <laughs> It might not be the kind of thing you want to read to your English grandmother at tea, but it will probably be the thing that will make people laugh. A lot of funny poems make use of gross stuff or funny things, and you can use animals as great inspiration for that. Poetry tip number three, we can tap into our personal experiences as sources of inspiration for poetry. So personal experiences, a time you felt really embarrassed, or a time you felt very melancholy and sad, a time you felt just over the moon with happiness. So then look all those times in your head now and tell me about a time you were extremely happy. What was the time you were extremely happy and why? Nobody was ever extremely happy here, obviously. They're not happy children, Adora. <laughs> Nobody ever had a time they were extremely happy? Oh. Yeah. Okay, when your cousins come over, you were really excited about that. What else? Have you guys ever really rooted for a sports team and just been totally all over it when they won? Or have you ever applied for something or tried out for something that you were so happy to be accepted into or won a contest? what to write about when we write our poem together. So an eating contest of tacos is a good idea. I'll keep that by with. What are other personal experiences? What about a time you guys are embarrassed? Anyone been really embarrassed? They're too embarrassed to tell you. I think they're too embarrassed to tell okay, you. Okay, I have a super, I have a really, really super embarrassing one, and this one was not at all charitable of me. So, you know I organized this conference, TEDx Redmond, I was super proud of it. And uh, before TEDx Redmond, this is, so this is the youth conference I'm organizing, I was trying to spread the word through our local community organization. So I wrote an email to someone from the city of Redmond, where I live, uh, and he was doing another sort of competing event on the weekend after, and I said, hey, do you want to spread the word about TEDx Redmond, and we'll spread the word about your event? No response, and, uh, and uh, not very receptive from this person. So afterwards, uh, TEDx Redmond got 750 attendees, or some, uh, something like that, over 700 attendees, and his event got, I think, like 50 or 60 people coming. So I was kind of really proud of this. But I learned by going to the website that, that his conference had invited many of the speakers that we had invited to our conference. So it was clear that he had done some research on who we had invited and uh, contacted them. So I was a little bit uh, not, not happy that they hadn't you know, promoted TEDx Sermon. So I wrote an email and, uh, about how great TEDx Sermon was, uh, basically. But I didn't quite realize that my email showed who was writing it. So, yeah, it was pretty embarrassing when I saw Dear Adora, glad that TEDx Redmond, so, yeah, that's what you get for trying to, uh, for 
I guess, uh, writing emails, not realizing that it says who sent them. Okay, so very, very embarrassing, very stupid thing for me to do, and uh, it's, it's all okay now. But tapping in your personal experience at a time when you felt super embarrassed about something, that can be a great thing to do. Uh, there's lots of really funny poems. Here's one, of, uh, one that I really like, Halloween Party by Ken Nesbitt. We're having a Halloween party at school. I'm dressed up like Dracula. Man, I look cool. I dyed my hair black and I cut off my bangs. I'm wearing a cape and some fake plastic fangs. I put on some makeup to paint my face white like creatures that only come out in the night. My fingernails, too, are all pointed and red. I look like I'm recently back from the dead. My mom drops me off and I run into school and suddenly feel like the world's biggest fool. The other kids stare at me like I'm some kind of freak. The Halloween party is not till next week. So this would be an embarrassing situation for anyone to be in, and so the authors obviously picked up some inspiration from something which would otherwise be a total loss and turn it into something fun. So think of times where you were embarrassed or sad or happy, and keep those in mind because I'll be asking you later when we write our poem together about them. Poetry tip number four, looking at photographs, looking at images. These can be great sources when you see posters with really evocative images, or when you just look at a picture. So I have a lot of pictures on my wall over here uh, on this side. So for instance, I have this map. I have this image, which is kind of cut off. I have some photos from a school that I did a poetry unit with. I have a, like a um, Chinese drawing, I think. And then, let's see, this is an internet safety thing. So I have all these different posters. So like this one over here, which is kind of blocked right now. Sorry, it shows a ship coming in and lots of people and these really large uh, this this handshaking these handshaking two people and I think it's uh, from a book about like immigration or coming to the United States or something so you can look at images posters drawings and draw your own meaning you don't have to necessarily write literally about what's in the picture this is what the picture is about you could look at the image and how does it make you feel ask yourself questions history is a great inspiration for poetry what have you guys been studying in history Learning in history. Social studies, anybody? Nothing? That's nothing. That's a very nice club. We're learning about the cotton gin. You're learning about the, sorry? The cotton gin. The cotton gin. Oh, the cotton gin, okay. Uh, great, that's that's a very interesting invention, how much it how much it impacted the South and what role played in history. That's, uh, interesting. Yeah, so history is a wonderful inspiration for poetry. There's many poems that have been written about history that are very famous. So poems have been written about these great battles. Long epic poems have been written about mythology that continue to be read widely today. So history provides a big stepping stone. When you look back, history is essentially a big story. It's the story of everything that's happened to us. And poems are just another way of telling stories or sharing your expression. And so when you write a poem, you not only you can not only tell the story of something in history, but you could also share how you feel or how the character in history feels, and that's a pretty amazing thing to be able to do. So, uh, I want to quickly open up a word document, and we're going to write down all of our different ideas for poems. We're going to have a little brainstorm here. So, with these different ideas from where we can get our ideas, we shouldn't have too hard of a time. I'm hoping. So. Let's start with, well, really anything. Animals, personal experiences. What do you think we should write a poem about? I'm going to be writing down the ideas. What do you think we should write a poem about? We're going to write, she's going to write down your ideas. School. School, okay. So what about school? What about school? Uh, okay. How annoying it is! That's the best! How annoying it is! Adora? How annoying it is! 
okay, so here's one idea. School, homework, how annoying it is. What else? What are our other ideas? So we have homework, what else? Summer. Summer, okay. So what are your thoughts on summer? How non it is. Dolphins? Dolphins? I'm sorry? <laughs> Dolphins, okay, great. Dolphins are very pretty. What else? So we have homework, summer, dolphins, other ideas. Monkeys. 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 All right. So we oh, monkeys. Monkeys. So we have some animal ideas running here. What are history? What are some ideas to put you about history? Or inspired by history? Ninjas. <laughs> okay, sure. What, although, um, arguably more like pop culture, but uh, not going to press that. Okay, so let's get, so we have animals, we've got history, slash pop culture, we've got school. What about personal experience? Personal experience. What's a personal experience that you have or that many people might have? Personal experience. I'm going to keep it here. Okay. <laughs> Great, what else? This is what's on the embarrassing track. Anything else? Um, once when I was skiing, I uh, hit a fence and I got stuck. Okay, <laughs> getting stuck in a fence while skating. And let's get one more. Uh, getting embarrassed in front of your crush. Getting embarrassed in front of your crush? Okay, so how? Okay, so we'll just leave it at that. And any other ideas? What are objects? How can we get ideas for objects? So our last, the poem letter with the last pass was from a couch. We just said couch and we had the poem. So what are ideas for objects? Any object ideas? Jolly Ranchers. Jolly Ranchers, okay. And oh, by the way, I forgot to insert the taco eating contest here. Okay, Jolly Ranchers and one more object for a poem. Hot potato, okay, as in the game or it's in a real hot potato? Right. A hot potato. Really oh, hot potato. Hot potato. Okay, real. Um, I mean, into so that because every time somebody says hot potato, I think of game. All right, so now these are too many topics to vote on. It's a lot of topics. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll quickly section them off. So we have. Um, Actually, yeah, quickly we'll vote. Okay, raise your hand if, we think, if you think we should write about homework. Uh, oh, and can, can I see the lights? Sorry. Um, otherwise, it's hard. There's no hands. There's no Oh, there's no hands. Okay, great. Summer. What about summer? Raise your hand if you think we should write about summer. All right. Raise your hand if you think we should write about dolphins. Raise your hand for monkeys. <laughs> okay, ninjas. Oh, Peeing in your pants. <laughs> Water in his hands. Uh, I can't. Okay, getting stuck in a fence while skating. Getting embarrassed in front of your crush. Taco eating contest. Jolly Ranchers. Hot potato. Okay, uh, is it a tie between ninjas and peeing in your pants? Uh, I can't quite. We could write about both. Okay, that would be weird. Um, yeah, see so you have an image of Actually, that would be interesting. Uh, you'd be like, I'm a ninja, so I'm supposed to be like, you know, undefeatable and really dignified and everything, and then, uh oh. That would be a strange call. Okay, so, ninjas? Raise your hand for ninjas? All right, and raise your hand for peeing your pants. I look like ninjas. ninjas. Okay, we're gonna write a poem about ninjas. Uh, I think this is the first ninja poem that we have written. So, uh, what comes to mind when you think about ninjas? So all.
dressed in black. Yeah, so very undercover. What else? So let's think of the image. And also, should this be a funny poem? Should it be a serious poem? Should it be a rhyming poem? Definitely. Okay. I was going to say, like, ideas for ninja. Uh, chain mail. Chain mail? Okay, so dressed in black, chain mail. Oh, should we start writing the poem, by the way, like with a description, or should we just collect des describing words right now? Brainstorm. Okay, we're going to brainstorm now. So, words that describe ninjas. Dressed in. Words that describe. Ninjas. Dressed in black, chain mail. What are some other things to think of about ninjas? Yeah, I'm sorry? Valuable. Okay, sure. Actually, let me quickly look up. It might be worthwhile to look up the definition. Okay, so a ninja is a person, according to the dictionary on Google, uh, a ninja is a person skilled in ninjutsu. I don't know what ninjutsu is, but it sounds dangerous. Uh, a ninja is a covert agent. Okay, so what we know about ninjas is that they are really good at uh, fighting and that they're undercover. So we can add that. Okay, so what do you think our poem should be about? So our poem, our poem isn't going to be just we're going to write a list of words that describe a ninja, is it? No, it's just brainstorming. Okay, this is just brainstorming. So we have words that describe ninjas. Now we have to think about how are we going to write this poem? Is it going to be from the point of view of a ninja? Is it going to be someone who has a weird fear of ninjas? Is it somebody who uh, wants to become a ninja but isn't sure how and is having difficulties trying to become a ninja? What are, what are your ideas? A ninja learning how to be a ninja. Okay, so 